Hi, this is Khalid. This is a quick recreation of a talk I did on analogies and math. Let's hop in. So, what's this? Well, it's a number. Okay. It was written down probably a few thousand years ago. Great. And people, I suppose, back then could have read it if they spent enough time. And if we want to, we can spend time today too. So let's see, we have M, um, that's 1,000, okay. Then we have CM, that's 100 less than 1,000, so that's 900. Then we have XC, which is 10 less than 100, so that's 90. Then we have VII, which is 2 more than 5 or 7. So that number is 1997. Okay, I mean, that wasn't that fun. And the question is, why was it hard? Why was that difficult? Why was one representation so much easier? Well, there's a few answers. One is that, hey, we're just not smart enough. Sorry, guys, our brains just can't handle Roman numerals. And we should be able to, right? I mean, computers can do it. Why can't we? And we're just not smart enough to do it. And we're just bad at math. That's one answer. And maybe it is possible that humans just aren't incapable of understanding numbers. But I think the better answer is that those numbers were poorly designed. Roman numerals aren't a great representation of numbers. We're trying to keep track of numbers in terms of, you know, two more than five and one less than 10. We can't just say nine. We really need to say one less than 10 and so on. So it makes things really complicated and there's not really a good reason for it. The result is that it's cumbersome, hard to use. And, you know, our brains just are doing extra work they don't have to. So my goal for learning is to really find the analogies that help things make sense. So the analogy of numbers being in terms of, you know, one more than five, one less than 10, that isn't a great system. But decimals are a much better system, and that's what we use today. So the idea is that an analogy is sort of like a raft that you use across the river. The river is the problem, the concept, something that you want to understand, and the raft is how you approach it. Now, if you don't have an analogy at all, Yes, maybe you're strong enough to swing to the other side just by pure brute force, but usually you have a mental model that helps you with the problem. The problem is some mental models aren't as good as others. So the idea of Roman numerals, it works, but it's not as good as decimals. And so we're sort of taking a weaker raft across the river when we try to use them. But let's just take a look at a few examples of uh, mental models that we've had so far. So rocks are actually the first mental model for counting. Um, the word calculus um, comes from pebble. And so the idea that numbers are basically rocks that we're counting is a very powerful analogy. It sounds simple, but it's really powerful. The reason is we've actually taken out all the differences, right? There's a bunch of rocks in this photo, different sizes, colors, shapes, weights, everything. But we're all counting them as rocks. And so that's actually a big idea that we've taken things that are different in many ways but looked at some kind of unifying principle behind them, and now we're counting that. So the first concept is that numbers are like rocks. Numbers are these physical things that kind of unify um, disparate items, and we can sort of count them together. And it works pretty well, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We can, with enough time, count you know a herd of sheep. We can count money. It works pretty well. But what's this? Well, it's zero, zero rocks, zero sheep, zero billion dollars are right here. Zero of the most beautiful painting in the world is right here. Zero is a really weird concept, and when you've tied your concept of a number to physical items, concepts like zero become difficult. Now, we might work through it and say, okay, let's allow for nothingness. So we can allow for nothingness as well as somethingness. Okay. How about this? What's less than nothing? What's a negative rock? Is it a rock that I owe you? Well, if, you, if you're holding it, it's not negative, right? Is negative money money that I owe you? Again, if I gave it to you, well, it might be negative to me, but it sure seems positive to you. There's a lot of things that kind of get messed up when we're trying to do this very physical analogy. So the, the analogy, the raft is starting to break down. It's not, it's not really... Um, helping us understand things. And in fact, even in the 1700s, 1759, people thought the negative numbers were confusing. They darkened the very whole doctrines of the equations, right? They were, just didn't make sense. It was a weird concept. And the problem was our analogy just couldn't handle it. But of course, you know, any third grader can tell you, we now have the concept of a number line. 
So moving to a number line allowed us to allow negatives and zero to be um, kind of part of the picture, right? So instead of zero being a void, zero became the neutral point, became the center. It became the place that you start at, and then every number is moving away from zero. So that's a really cool concept. And then positive and negative numbers, they're not that different. They're really just left and right, different directions off that, that same starting point. So something that became really, or that something that was really, really difficult became easy with the right analogy. Let's keep going. How about something like this, i squared equals negative one? Well, this is super confusing. Again, our raft is starting to shake. Is there any number that when you square it becomes negative? Zero squared is still zero. A positive number when you square it is still positive. And a negative number when you square it becomes positive. So it seems like there's no solution. But again, this is a little bit like trying to find that negative rock. We're trying to apply an analogy in a way that we're limiting ourselves. That analogy isn't the end truth, right? There might be a different way of thinking of it that makes it make sense, but we're kind of stuck in this old system. Here's an idea. If we have a number line going left and right, why not another number line going north and south, right? We have east-west. Why not allow north and south? If we allow this extra dimension, now our numbers can move up and down or left and right. And the imaginary dimension allows us to get to negatives in two steps. Saying i squared equals negative 1 is really saying, is really saying I'm starting at 1, I multiply by i, I multiply by i again, and I get to negative 1. So if i represents a 90 degree rotation, then rotating twice takes you backwards. That's essentially what i squared equals negative 1 says. Two 90 degree rotations points you backwards. So again, coming to the right analogy makes something that seems baffling click because we're actually using the right, the right metaphor. We're thinking about the right way. So we've gone from rocks to lines to 2D directions, and that seems pretty good. So let's, let's put this into action a little bit. Here's a very famous equation, Euler's identity, and it's considered one of the most beautiful ones in math. If you ask a mathematician friend or a physicist, this is usually considered the most beautiful identity in all of mathematics. It relates so many different concepts. The problem is it's really confusing. And again, mathematicians thought it was just crazy when it came out. e to the i pi equals negative 1. We're, we're taking these crazy constants. Pi, you know, 3.14 goes on forever, is irrational. i is this weird dimension, and e is another irrational number. All of these combined equal negative 1 in such a clean way. It's crazy. And so people thought that, okay, it's true. I mean, there are proofs of it, but it just can't be understood. And again, that's coming from our existing analogies. If we have poor analogies for what numbers are, then yes, concepts, concepts like this are difficult. But with the right analogies, they can make sense. So let's take a crack at it. I like to mentally colorize equations. I want to understand what every single part of the equation is trying to say. Normally, we look at equations as sort of a mix of symbols. But if we can identify what each part is doing, it becomes a sentence. It becomes a, a story of what's actually happening. So let's start. E represents growth. It could be an entire separate video, but essentially E is the concept of growth, continuous growth. And I, as we saw, is a concept of going sideways, not going in the normal direction, going sideways. So the concept is, okay, we have growth, but instead of growing like we want to, we're actually growing sideways, okay? And now we say, well, how long do we do this for? And pi is actually halfway around a circle. A unit circle has two pi as its full circumference. So a single pi is actually just halfway around the circle. So we have the concept of growth going sideways that is lasting for half a circle. And if we plot it out, it looks like this. We have growth, but it's going sideways. And we have enough fuel in the growth engine to point us backwards. So this equation here is saying, okay, this system, growth pushing sideways with enough fuel to last for half a circle, will ultimately point you backwards to negative 1. We start at 1 here. That's the implied starting point. 1 times this. You grow sideways with enough fuel to go half a circle, and you'll end up backwards. So the key here is that we understood a concept that was baffling with a very simple diagram and analogy. And now to really test it, 
Let's try a few different scenarios. What if we don't put in any fuel? What if we want to grow sideways, but we decide not to grow at all? We have the engine ready to go, but we don't fuel it up. If we put a zero here instead, then we would stare at a starting point at one. Now again, mathematically, we can say that anything to the zeroth power is one, which is true, but I think it's more helpful to think, okay, if I have this setup, but I don't put any fuel in the system, I don't use it, then I stay at my starting point. Or again, if I put in twice as much fuel, I should circle all the way around. Because if I put in pi units, I get halfway. If I put in two pi units, I should go all the way around the circle. And again, we can mathematically say that if we square both sides, it should be one. But I'd like to think of it as, okay, if I put in twice the fuel, I'm going all the way around. So this is a way to take that analogy and really put it to work and help it understand you. So the main takeaway for me is that good analogies make math a joy. An idea that's really baffling can become simple and even enjoyable if we can see it the right way. So that's the heart of my philosophy. If I'm confused by something, I don't think my CPU isn't good enough. I just think I have the wrong analogy. Happy math.